Hello, and welcome to another very special episode of the Sales Ops Demystified podcast. And today, we're joined by Bradley Streit, who is currently running uh, the sales operation at Insurity. Now, what I'm interested in digging into with today is something that I, I'm super ex- interested about how people get into sales ops and, and kind of the part of sales ops that they focus on. I know Bradley has a background in finance and accounting, which is actually quite rare from the, the hundred or so interviews I've done. So that's what I want to, that, that's what I would like to look at as well, Bradley, if that's okay with you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I kind of come from a non-standard background, I think you'll find. Um, and, and really fortunate to have a blessed career, just right place, right time. Mm. And, and absolutely th- uh, thankful for all that. So happy to touch base on that. Uh, you know, proud of proud about all the stops. So you'll see Perfect. there's a lot. <laughs> so, so this actually leads very nicely into question number one, which is how did you initially get into sales operations? Uh, so I guess to take a step background, I, I come from, I guess, a blue collar family, uh, grew up on a family owned orchard. It was in our family for like a hundred generations. So I had no, uh, anybody in my family who had corporate experience, no real understanding of what like a businessman does. It's just a, a term you use like, Oh, a businessman, you know, I don't know. They wear white collars, right? And and so, you know, I was the youngest one. I have two older brothers. And when I was getting close to being 18, just kind of pulled, my dad pulled me to the side and said, you know, hey, it's, it's a small business. You know, having three owners is a little tough. You know, do you, do you think you could go to college, get a degree and do something mm-hmm. else? I'm like, you know what? I, I play sports. I love to go to school. Like, you know, I'll, I'll do it. Um, and, and so I kind of went undeclared. Uh, and, and played sports, you know, it just had no priorities really. Um, left, work construction for a couple years, and then really found a school because uh, I, I was sick and tired of making money off my body. I wanted to go and finish my athletics, uh, mm-hmm. but then more importantly, get a business degree and, and go start making money off my mind rather than uh, through the daily grind. So I, I found a school in uh, called RIT in Rochester, New York. Uh, they're really tech focused. That was really attractive to me, and and they had D three sports. So it kind of checked off my two boxes. Uh, my freshman year, I had an accounting class. I got really high marks in it with very little effort. So I just identified I had a natural kind of knack for it, and in my eyes, it lined up because every organization has to have general ledger. So to me, it, it has the best job security and, and the widest net for somebody who, whose future is uncertain. I got to go carve out my own path. So, so that, that was kind of the way I looked at it. And, and I, I uh, also concentrated in economics and a minor in management information systems. Uh, so I wasn't skilled enough to learn how to code, mm-hmm. but I know how the data tables talk in the back end. And that really play, played a pivotal role uh, once I made the transition from accounting over into uh, sales operations and started and why doing did more you, analysis. At, at like, with like someone in the organization at the time, did they say, Bradley, you should move over into sales ops? Uh, how did that actually happen for you to move over? Yeah, absolutely. So I, I went with a software company out in Minneapolis, Minnesota, uh, moved myself out there, super driven and ambitious. And I was just really looking for any opportunity to get promoted, to get a pay increase. And a job opening opened up uh, for sales operations. I had no clue what it was. And so I asked uh, Kevin Dale, our um, finance uh our, our director of finance at the time. And, and he just said, hey, I think you'd be perfect for it. You should definitely apply. And, and so I did. I linked up with uh, Chuck Lentz, who, who was head in the org at the time. And he took me under the wing. He was really great with the inside sales and the lead gen. And, and I just ran with the analytics. Uh, you know, We set up at-risk programs. And, and it was just immediate exposure to executive level, senior level uh, colleagues and, and learning from them. Uh, and, and one of the biggest barriers I first had to get out of was 
was my introversion. So, so I signed up for Toastmasters nice. uh, to, to get the public speaking skills. And, and I wasn't even prepared speeches because that wasn't my problem. If you give me time and I prepare, I can come and knock it out of the park. But when you're in a meeting about at-risk customers and the CEO asks you a question and you know it, but you clam up because of that anxiety, I, I just had to solve that. So I would go unscripted and just give speech after speech until I finally could could talk uh, impromptu um, with some semblance of respect. Obviously, always still honing that side mm-hmm. of my myself. Um, and, and so that you know, that's why I fell in love with it. Just the the strategic, the analysis. It, it gives as a former accountant who did I only did I lasted a year and a half in that career because it's so. Uh, crushing it, you're constrained by these rules, gap, and all of that. And but it's important to understand those principles because that's how your company is measured when it comes down to EBITDA and understanding those key metrics. But but being able to go then and do the analysis and use the economics information to inform my analysis. Well, I'm seeing these market trends, so I'm going to influence my forecast based on not just you know the data saying, but also through through direct observation and, and other external inputs. Well, the, your talking is very good at the moment. So Toth Masters was, was I, I've also been through it and it was phenomenal. It was like a lot of work and quite scary, but amazing. Anyway, I, I'd like to zoom in to today and specifically at the tech stack you're running at Insurity. Yeah, uh, in terms of tech stack, uh, we have Salesforce. That's our central CRM. Uh, Marketo is our marketing tool. We just moved over there from Pardot. So we have used both, uh, both have pros and cons. I, everywhere I've worked, we've had Salesforce, Marketo, or Pardot. And then we integrate with our finance system, whether that's Intact or Oracle. Uh, but just having those integrations and then working to automate systems so they communicate across each other and drive consistent data and uh, what's important to me is that I'm not spending my time doing manual, tedious, individual contributor tasks, but I'm able to have that stuff automated and streamlined so the the information and data is coming in cleanly. And then me and my team can spend our time doing more meaningful work, like proactively looking for revenue opportunity, uh, proactively looking to support others in the organization, doing the analysis and, and brainstorming, looking for new ways of, of doing things more effectively, that kind of stuff. Sure. And now over the past few months, I assume you guys have been moving to a more remote operation. What have been the challenges around that? Yeah, uh, you know, I think we were fortunate that we had a largely blended uh, we were a very remote friendly company to start. We had a lot of uh, at at office employees. Don't get me wrong, um, but very remote friendly, even work from home friendly. So we didn't have like desktop stations, and everybody has a laptop. So you you already mm-hmm. had that mobility and agility. I think that's one of the benefits of working in the software industry. I do, not, um, I, and I think sorry to jump in, but mm-hmm. I think like companies that are younger than. 10 years old and below like a thousand people are like laptop first. And so mm-hmm. the switch for them was like seamless. But if you take a company that's bigger than that or older than that, the switch for them was like disastrous. And so oh, yeah. I think that this whole working remote thing is benefiting the smaller, newer companies, which I think is just good overall. Would you agree? I think I definitely agree with you. And and some of those legacy companies you touched on, you know, you uh, when we think about is the, is this trend going to stay? I think for a large part, it it's not, it's not going to go away. It's not going to be as prevalent because some companies do use their office as a recruiting tool. And, and people like myself, I'm an office guy. So while most of the company were remote and used to it. It was a big shift for me, myself personally, to get the discipline of working at home, not letting yourself fall into bad daily habits. Um, and, and so I kind of had a period where you know I overslept and had to just adjust my body. But now I'm kind of 
in a better spot actually where you know I'm I'm living a bit healthier. I'm not going out obviously, no more happy hours. Uh, but also um, the sleep is is critical too. It's it's just quieter in the city and getting better quality sleep and waking up earlier and you know the biggest fight these days is, is cabin fever uh but but i i to get to your original point um you know with it being a, a competitive advantage i think the big thing that will stay with is legacy companies that do probably want the folks to come back to the office is the business continuity plans H- how are we going to deal with this again so so there's definitely opportunities in that and, and and good companies will will you know take those lessons learned from this event and, and have a more remote friendly uh you know part of their uh business continuity plans. I think this was just one of those unforeseen events. Like what do you mean I can't go to the office and access my work computer? Like mm. uh, you know I probably never thought of that uh before. Yeah. So did you guys make any operational, cultural, or tech changes in response to the remote sales operation? Yeah, I think uh, our leadership team did a really phenomenal job of pivoting to a virtual world. We we didn't cancel our community, our customer event. We switched it right away to a virtual event. Uh, you know, um, Jim St. John, our director of uh, revenue operations, and, and his team did a phenomenal job uh, of doing that and on such a short timeline uh, and, and in kind of uncharted territory. So they, and, and not just uh, our customer events, but our internal, our QBRs, uh, Michelle Shepard, our CRO, she, she made those pivots, all the forecast calls, video on, you know, let's have fun. Um, you know, we, we played some games. I took some like screen grabs where people's beards were getting really long and would put up like, you know, does he look like this hockey player or is that, mm-hmm. you know... Our sales rep, which which one is which? Uh, so just trying to have some fun, uh, but we did definitely, you know, and I and I give the leadership credit to that because they identified that this wasn't a really short thing, and, and they made the the commitment to uh, being virtual friendly. So I find when when things ebb down from the leadership, uh, you know, the adoption just goes so much more seamlessly. And our, our company, I, I got to give them kudos for for the great job everybody's done. Yeah. Do you think those changes will f- remain? You, you you mentioned that you think remote, like, like these options to be remote will remain, but these changes that you just mentioned, say like having more fun and video on, do you think that will persist into the future regardless of whether you're forced to be remote? I, I think it has to in some fashion. You know, uh, if you think from a pure cost perspective, an on-site event is going to be more costly than some of these remote events. So maybe rather than meeting four times a year in person, you meet once or twice uh, and two by remote. And that doesn't uh, cause concern or grief with folks because they understand it's not a bad thing. It's not, you know, it's definitely different. You know, I, I love getting together with the sales folks and, and mingling with them because usually you don't get to see the folks in the field too frequently. So, so that relationship building is important. That's why as an operations professional, I love those events. And, and uh, they're like mandatory attendance for me. If I had vacation, I would probably reschedule my vacation mm. so I could show up. Because there's relationships, you know, then when you need help, you need answers. Because a lot of sales ops outside of the systems work and the data it is the quarterbacking and, and the cross-department collaboration uh, you know, I always kind of describe fix when I was earlier in my career. Well, what do you do? What is sales ops? And I was when I was younger, and I was just doing more task oriented stuff and helping get stuff done. It, it's like I like help these extroverted salespeople talk to these introverted people in finance and and R and D, and that's like the best. You know, and 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 I'm an introvert myself, but I am envious and push myself to be an extrovert. So I feel like I do well at that uh, brokering of those relationships um, because, you know, different people look at things through different lenses. And and again, I pay tribute to the finance background I've been blessed to come up with because uh, it's just opened up so many doors and helps me put things in perspective from both sides. helps explain the what's in it for us and, and why certain people are doing things or asking 
uh, for certain things uh, and, and just helping to promote that culture of teamwork and, and trust. Yeah, sure. How have the target floor objectives changed for the sales team? Uh, we haven't made any adjustments. So we're tracking still towards our original budgets. Uh, that said, we have done you know several scenario planning. So we kind of just look at where we're at and you know use it as a guideline. But uh, you know we feel that we sell enterprise systems into a market that needs you know it's critical business system. So. The ROI is still there. You know, our, our customers are insurance carriers. So, you know, their market definitely is affected by, um, you know, the stock market swings and all that. But uh, they also see the value of, you know, modernizing their systems because it costs them money to stay on legacy platforms. Uh, so it definitely still makes it tough because uh, different organizations have different approaches to COVID. Some are aggressive, like... My company has acquired two companies since it. So we're very much uh, business as usual. You know, we uh, have faith in our products and have faith in our customer base. Uh, you know, we work closely with them. It's the, you know, consultative approach and, and really doing the best thing for both companies and, and understanding. So things shift in and out of the forecast. And, and but we have the structure, the process, the meetings, and so we're aligning with product. We're talking to all the folks, and 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 really, be, that's been the hugest impact I think on me personally, is the amount of data requests that come in uh, from different teams because everybody is is looking to the data for for guidance in this in this kind of uncharted time. Got it. Now on, on to forecasting, and especially forecasting remotely, where you can't just walk up to the rep's desk to ask them whether you think this deal is going to close. How have you been ensuring that the forecast is accurate, even when you're you could be miles away from from the reps? Yeah, I, it's uh, you know data, past performance, you know understanding your teams who historically sandbags, who's an optimist. Mm-hmm. And having those same conversations, you know, I can't walk up to somebody's desk, but I can send them an instant message. I can send them an email. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with a movie called The Shawshank Redemption. Yeah. There's a scene where he talks about getting library books. He's like, I sent a letter a day until I finally got a response. And, <laughs> and I say the same thing to my employees. Like, hey, if you're following up and you don't hear back, like, send an email a day until they get back. Not an email a day, but you got to be like... But if he gets down to that, like, send him a day, uh, you know, whatever. Eventually, somebody has to answer. We, we got to hold ourselves accountable, you know, myself personally too. Personal accountability is critical. Um, but yeah, in terms of the forecasting, it's, it's just continuing this in a virtual environment, using the communication channels, knowing your teammates, knowing your colleagues, and, and listening, like, it is more crucial than ever because the data might mislead you. Uh, like I said, due to shifting, but if you're on a forecast call and you hear things that indicate a push, the close date pushes out, you know, having a push counter, uh, date since last sales stage, you know, is it getting stuck up in a roadblock and they're not talking about that on the call? To me, that's uh, uh, a red flag where I would want to follow up and ask them a more specific question to understand. Are you addressing this specific roadblock or are you avoiding talking about it because it's going to push into next quarter um, or next month? Uh, but, but just using, you know, it's almost like being a detective sometimes, uh, you know, to understand what's really going to close. And, and you really do have to end your forecast, um, you know, and, and, and work with your sales leadership team to craft one. And, and that's really the, the only way. It's tried and tested, I think, in any time period. And the data will get you there, but uh, it's those human interactions and and just understanding your team and working with your colleagues to form that that forecast that goes up to the decision makers. Makes total sense. Um, Now for the final and two most important questions of the interview. Who has taught you the most or been the most inspiration uh, in your career to date? Yeah, so this one is like, I could spend a whole call on this. I'm just... I've been blessed with working uh, with a lot of great colleagues. The first company I worked for was in by uh, Vista Equity Partners. 
who, you know, they focus on software company acquisitions. And so being in that environment where you have, uh, so one, the leadership team there was phenomenal and they, they promoted me, they let me build work on key initiatives and they coached me and taught me a lot along the way. So Scott Atkins, Todd Lattisau, uh, Kevin Dale, Mike Liston. I mean, I, I can go on. Um, but, you know, then the, the being part of that portfolio and having access to 20 other sales ops leaders and, and bouncing um, ideas off of them. Uh, Michelle Shepard, who's our current, my current CRO, you know, she recruited me to come work for her and, and has really like helped me develop even more leadership skills and, and sales ops skills, take on more responsibility. Uh, Stuart Kaplan is working on the more polished side of me. I, I'm a blue collar worker. So sometimes I have some, um, you know, bad habits where like I'm frustrated or something. And so working to be, you know, like identify this and, and just step up, take a step back and, and be a leader. Um, so, so just really thankful to have people who are willing to train and coach you. I've been at places where, uh, you know, they, they don't invest the development as much or invest in development as much. So really fortunate to, to be with those folks and, and to learn from them. Uh, Kevin Dale, I think I mentioned earlier, he, he's the one who told me uh, to go into sales ops. And he also told me so much about Excel, which, uh, you know, I, I use religiously and, and, you know, that's where I do a lot of my slicing and dicing. Mm. And then finally, who is someone within sales ops that you would love to take for lunch? Yeah, that would probably, uh, it's a toss up. I would say there's a, a gentleman, Jam- Jimmy Jetchick. He was our uh, biz ops guy at, at MicroEdge. One of the just like incredible talent in terms of Salesforce development. Would just love to catch up with him and see you know what he's got going on these days. Uh, and then the other one is somebody I see on LinkedIn posting a lot of really relevant stuff about revenue ops and that's Andre Martinelli. Uh, he was part of this equity back uh, in the day, I didn't really work with them that closely, but I do see his pace. They're just so like poignant. Um, so just love to learn from folks like that any any day. Awesome. Well, that was a well. I, I think we touched on quite a few things, but what I like about you is it seems like you well one you have the finance background, which seems to permeate and help you in almost everything that you've been working on. And so that, for me, is like enabling you to be effective. But it also seems that you are someone who is able to work very effectively with other people, particularly sales reps. And even if you are emailing them every day to get some info, they, they probably still like you. But that's just my impression from this interview. Um, do you think that's a- accurate, Brad? I appreciate that. I hope it's accurate. I'm sure like anything in life, you rub some people the wrong way. Uh, you know, but in, in my mind, I could have an argument with somebody and help them out in the very next second. Mm. It, it's business. It's not personal. And that comes from sports. Just separating and focusing on the goal at hand. You know, I can't pick my family members. I can't pick my teammates. I can't pick my colleagues a lot of the time. But we're all in it together. And, and if we build out and grow these companies, we all you know, provide for our families in a more effective way. So uh, you know, I, 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 that's big on me is, is being that team player. And, and uh, yeah, the finance stuff is important because that's what leadership wants at the end of the day, right? It's the reporting. When you, des- when you design your systems, if you think about the reporting, what you need at the output from the top level and waterfall that down, You'll, you'll design a really effective foundation of a system that's scalable. For sure. Brad, thank you so much for coming on today. Absolutely, Tom. Hey, thank you again for having me. It's been a pleasure and, and can't thank you enough for uh, letting me talk shop with you.